all day on the radio, there had been hurricane warnings. That night, in her attic bedroom, Meg Murray sat at the edge of her bed and watched the trees tossing in the frenzied lashings of the wind. She wasn't usually afraid of weather. It's not just the weather, it's the weather on top of everything else. On top of me doing everything wrong. Like being sent to Mr. Jenkins' office today. I don't understand how a child with parents as brilliant as yours can be such a poor student. If you don't start to pay attention and do better, you'll have to stay back next year. Meg decided to make herself some cocoa. At least, she thought, if the roof blows off, I won't go with it. In the kitchen, a light was already on, and Meg's little brother, Charles Wallace, was sitting at the table drinking milk and eating bread and jam. Hi, I've been waiting for you. I knew you'd be down. I put some milk on the stove. How did Charles Wallace always know about her? He never knew or seemed to care what the twins, Dennis or Sandy, were thinking. It was his mother's mind and Meg's that he probed with frightening accuracy. Was it because people were a little afraid of him that they whispered about the Murray's youngest child? I don't think the baby boy's all there. Couldn't talk till he was four. Yet the father's a famous physicist and the mother's a bacteriologist. And their two other boys seem to be nice, regular children. But the little boy and the older sister, that unattractive girl with glasses... Meg's father had laughed when she told him what she had overheard. It was just before he went away, and Meg remembered clearly what he had said. Now don't worry about Charles Wallace, Meg. There's nothing the matter with his mind. He's just different. He does things in his own time and his own way. I don't want him to grow up dumb like me. Oh, Meg, honey, you're not dumb. You're like Charles Wallace. Your development has to go at its own pace. It just doesn't happen to be the usual pace. Thinking of her father brought tears to Meg's eyes. It was almost a year now since his last letter, and when her mother tried to find out anything from Washington, all they'd say was that Professor Murray was on a secret and dangerous mission and couldn't communicate with them for a while. But it was plain that no one was really sure about where he was or what he was doing, or, most importantly, when he might be back. In any case, he was gone. And it was one of the saddest things in Meg's life. I put in extra milk. I thought Mother would like some, too. <laughs> I might like what? Cocoa. Would you like a liverwurst and cream cheese sandwich, Mother? I'll be happy to make you one. Here in the kitchen with Mother and Charles Wallace, things were about as cozy and comfortable as they could get. Meg was not in the least expecting what happened next. What came through the door after Mrs. Murray opened it was, to say the least, even more unexpected. It looked more like a bundle of wet rags than a person. But it was indeed a woman. And she evidently knew Charles Wallace, and Charles Wallace knew her. Her name was Mrs. Whatsit. My! Isn't this a lovely warm place? And sandwiches, too. How nice! I just got a little blown off course when I realized I was at little Charles Wallace's house. I thought I'd just come in and rest a bit. I'll only stay just a minute. But she stayed more than a minute. And they had cocoa and sandwiches just as if it were a regular visit. But there was one thing she said, just one little offhand remark, that made Meg suddenly realize that this was not just a regular visit. It was when she was getting ready to leave. You really should stay over, Mrs. Watson. This is much too wild a night to travel in. Oh, wild nights are my glory. No, I'll just pop on my boots and then I'll be on my way. Oh, and speaking of ways, my pet, there is such a thing as a tesseract. Meg's mother suddenly went very white and with one hand reached backward and clutched a chair for support. And a few minutes later, Mrs. Watson was out of the door gone. The next day in school, Meg could think of almost nothing else but the strange events of the night before. And it was plain when she got home that Charles had been thinking about the same thing. Don't sit down, Meg. We've got to go. Go? Go where? To see Mrs. What's it? I want to find out more about that Tesseract thing. Oh. The road Charles and Meg took was an old one and was not often used. 
It wound through a deep pine woods. They live in that big old house near the hill. You know, the one that's been empty for so long and it's supposed to be haunted. They? Yes. It's not just Mrs. Watson. She has these two friends that live there, too. Charles Wallace seemed to know a great deal. But one thing he didn't know was that they were not alone on this adventure. Who's that? Who? Up there on the road. I don't know. Maybe we should stop. Oh, I do know him. That's Calvin O'Keefe. He's in regional, but he's older than I am. He's on the basketball team. Calvin O'Keefe was tall, certainly, and his wrists and ankles seemed to stick out of the clothes that didn't quite fit him. But there was an odd sort of brightness about him. He explained how he had come to that road. It was a compulsion, you see. They come every once in a while. Not very often. Mrs. Whatsit wasn't in the old house, but one of her friends was. Mrs. Who, a plump woman wearing spectacles twice as thick and twice as large as Meg's. She was sewing on a sheet. Mrs. Whatsit has been so busy lately, what with this and that. Getting near time, Charlesy. Getting very near time. Ab honesto, willem bonum nihil deteret. That's Latin, you know. Seneca. It means nothing deters a good man from doing what is honorable. And he's a very good man. Who? Your father. He won't go without you. Shoo. Mrs. Murray was delighted to have Calvin join them for dinner. <laughs> we aren't having anything but stew tonight, but it's a good thick one. After dinner, Calvin and Meg picked their way carefully across the twins' vegetable garden, and Meg told him about her father's mysterious disappearance. Suddenly, the face of Charles Wallace popped out of the darkness. Okay, you two, I hate to break things up, but this is it, kids. This is it. Charles Wallace, what do you mean, this is it? We're going. Going? Where? I, I don't know exactly, but I think it's to find Father. In an instant, there beside him, where nothing had been before, was Mrs. Who. And in another instant, scrambling over a stone wall, there was Mrs. Watsit. Oh, it's so difficult to manage with all this wind. I don't think I shall ever learn to get around. Here, yeah, you've just gotten snagged on these branches. Oh, thank you. You're so clever at these things. Oh, well, you know, an old donkey knows more than a young colt. Now, wait a minute. Just because you happen to be a few billion years older is no reason... All right, girls. This is no time for bickering. It's Mrs. Witch. I do not think I will materialize completely. I find it very tiring and we have much to do. Mrs. Witch hovered only as a vague pulsing glow in the dark air. I think if you stood here, Mrs. Who... Yes, yes, that's good. And you, Mrs. What's it, with the children. Yes, yes, of course. And my sheet is a little tangled. Charles, your hand, please. But what are we doing? Hold tight. But what are we... Calvin, Charles! The words were flung back in her throat. In a great rush of air and time, Meg was suddenly, utterly alone, pushed headlong into a great space empty of all light and sound. She could feel no body, for she had none. No sound could be uttered, for there were no sounds. There was only blackness, more complete than any night she had known, and an absence of anything in the world except a sense of panic. Suspended, rushing through nothingness, there was no more Meg. Then there was a tingling, a tingling where her body once had been, as if it could possibly be there once again, and then a sound like her heart and a dim glow beyond her eyelids. Slowly, there seemed to be feeling once again, and a possibility of sounds being once more in her ears. Well, that was quite a trip. I do think you could at least have warned us. Meg, where's Meg? Then Meg felt something like a violent push and a shattering as though she had been thrust through a wall of glass. 
Meg. There you are. I did the best I could, but it's difficult with so many. That's quite all right. They looked around. They were in a large open field, sunlit with fragrant flowers and grass. It had been autumn at home, but surely this was spring or summer. Where are we? Yoria, the third planet of the star Malak in the spiral nebula Messier 101. But how could we be? Even if we traveled at the speed of light, it would take years and years. But we don't travel at the speed of anything. We tesser. Or you might say we wrinkle. Tesser. Meg suddenly remembered that mysterious thing that Mrs. Watson had said in the kitchen that had so affected her mother. Oh, and speaking of ways, my pet, by the way, there is such a thing as a tesseract. Does a tesser have anything to do with a tesseract? Yes. You see, instead of going from one point of space all the way to another... You just sort of bring the two points together. Like you would bring two points of a cloth together by wrinkling it. And then you just sort of pass right from one to the other. We travel in the fifth dimension. But what about Mother? When we don't come in at bedtime, well, Mother must be frantic by now. Now, don't worry, my pet. We took a time wrinkle as well as a space wrinkle. It's very easy if you just know how. And what about my father? Is he all right? For the moment, love, yes. Can't we go to him? In time, dear, yes. You must be patient. But I'm not patient. I've never been patient. Well, then, that is something you must definitely learn. Mrs. What's it? The children turned and were just in time to see the last whirling image of Mrs. Watsit before she became altogether transformed into a new creature that was now standing there. It was white, full of grace and strength, with great curling wings unfolding from the back of its powerful horse's body and the torso and head of a proud and dignified man there at the head of the creature. It was so like a Greek centaur the half-horse, half-man that Meg had read about, but also so very, very different. You will go, please. Mrs. Watson, will she... She will take you. You must see what must be seen for yourselves. And the man-horse creature gently knelt. In her new form, Mrs. Watson's voice was warm and rich. Come now, children. The children climbed on. Hold fast! With a great rush of wind through the wings and a rising thrust into the sky, the children were lifted boldly above the ground and carried with a grace and swiftness they had never known before. Far across the meadows and lowlands they sped, then meeting with the mountains, up, up until the air grew chill and the clouds that enveloped them stung with drops of icy dew. Abruptly, they broke through the clouds. Now the air grew thinner, cold, more sharp. Still, the mountain ascended before them. They struggled to breathe. Then, the hooves of the creature who bore them hovered and set gently onto a smooth rock. They seemed at the top of the world. Perhaps they were. There before them, in the clear, blue beauty of the sky, glowed the large silver disk of a moon, Uriel's moon, so much larger than that of the Earth. Then Mrs. Watson had the children turn around and ask them to watch straight ahead as far as they could see. They watched, their eyes straining against the softening glow of the light. Then Meg saw it. Then Calvin did too. Charles had already been watching it intently. A great black shadow, not cast by anything, but just hovering as a broad plane of darkness stretched across the sky. It was so faint, so distant, yet so fiercely dark. What's that? That sort of shadow out there. What is it? I don't like it. 
Keep watching, children. And they watched. In the fading light of day, stars began appearing in other parts of the sky, brilliant darts of light. But the shadow remained unaltered in its place, and through it, no star could be seen. Just in looking at this dark thing, Meg was chilled with a greater terror than she had ever known. Make it go away, Mrs. Watsit. Make it go away, it's evil. Come now, children. And Mrs. Watsit quietly turned and lifted them from the mountain ledge, carrying them back down to the valley floor. We wanted you to see it with your own eyes, to know something of what it is. It's stretched so far. Oh, so much more than you think. This planet is a safe one. What you saw was in another nebula. But now perhaps you should see this. A glowing crystal turned in Mrs. Witch's hand. Look. Faintly in its midst, an image appeared. A bright, glowing ball in velvet space. It grew larger and larger. Meg could see there on its surface the familiar outlines of continents and oceans from her geography lessons. She stared at its hazy form. It... it must be because of our atmosphere that we can't see it properly. No, no Meg, no, no, you, you know, know that, that it that is not, not the, the atmosphere. atmosphere. You, you must, must be, be brave. brave. It's the thing. It's the dark thing we saw from the mountain peak. Did it just come while we've been gone? Tell yeah. her. No, Meg, it hasn't just come. It's been there for a great many years. That's what my father is fighting, isn't it? Yes, yes Meg. Meg. I hate it. I hate the dark thing. Yes, Charles, dear. We all do. But, but what is it? We know it's evil. But what is it? You have said it. It is evil. It is the powers of darkness. Now, watch. Again, they focused their eyes on the crystal ball. The earth with its fearful covering of dark shadows swam out of view. Suddenly, there was a great burst of light throughout the darkness. The light spread out, and where it touched the darkness, the darkness disappeared. Then, slowly, the shining dwindled until it was all gone. Tell us, please, exactly what happened just then. It was a star, a star giving up its life in battle with the thing. It won, but it lost its life in the winning. I see. Now I understand. You were a star once, weren't you, Mrs. Wetsit? You were all stars. We are not alone, you know. So many great men on your planet have fought it through the years. So many great artists, leaders. Yes, people like Galileo, Beethoven, Madame Curie. But what about Father? Is he here? No, Meg, he is not here. This is a safe planet. We just stopped here for a rest and to let you know what it is you are up against. Your father is on the other side of the darkness that you saw from the mountains. He is on a planet that has given in. Kamasat. It is time now, children. You must not be frightened at what is going to happen. Without warning, Meg was swept into nothingness again. This time, the nothingness was interrupted by a feeling of clammy coldness such as she had never felt before. Then the darkness was gone. Had it been the black thing? Had they had to travel through it to get to her father? Now they were on a hillside, a plain, grassy hillside that could have been anywhere back home. The air was like a warm autumn day. And there below them, in the distance, were the smokestacks and the rooftops of a town. Is this Camasots? Yes. And now, children, you'll be on your own. Mrs. Watson had resumed her old shape for the Tesseract. She continued. We will be near you. We will be watching you. But we will not be able to come to you. To you, Meg, I leave my glasses. A little blind as a bat. But do not use them except as a last resort. Save them for the final moment of peril. Do 
all three of you, I give my command. Go down into the town. Go together. Do not let them separate you. Be strong. Be strong.